This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Sacred Geography. Why do some locations appear to be more supernatural than others? Straight ahead on A View from the Bunker. Space is not the final frontier, but there are those who want you to think it is. 75 years ago, something crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. An industry has grown up to sell the idea that the pilots were extraterrestrials. We want you to know the truth. For a limited time, we're making available a special offer featuring the groundbreaking book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. This book shows step-by-step how the occult teachings of Madame Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley grew into the ancient aliens hypothesis of the modern UFO movement. It's our Gilbert House Roswell Special. For just $35, we'll send you The Day the Earth Stands Still, plus our DVD sets, The Best of Sci Friday, Volumes 1 and 2. It's a $65 value for just $35. Take advantage of the Gilbert House Roswell Special for a limited time only, and you'll only find it at our store, online at gilberthouse.org. It's time once again for our monthly series featuring... uh, other out-of-the-box thinkers as we try to explore some of the deeper things of this supernatural war in which we all find ourselves. Uh, first, the pastor of... Um, I'd scrolled down and I lost his uh, bio info. There we are. Pastor of the Reformed Baptist Church of Northern Colorado in Boulder. Uh, we uh, also appreciate his uh, writing, uh, Giant Sons of the Gods, Conspiracy Theory, and most recently co-author of The Angel of the Lord, a Biblical, Historical, and Theological Study, uh, Pastor Doug Van Dorn, and our friendly neighborhood PhD, Director of the Institute of Biblical Anthropology, author of Interview with Giant, elect- Ethno-Historical Notes on the Nephilim, and uh, you'll, find, you'll see the links to their websites, uh, come up on the screen here as they join us uh dr judd burton uh doug judd thank you for joining us uh, again this week sadly we'll be without brian Gadawa this week last minute uh schedule complication yeah, he's kind of a bomb he just shot that on us like 30 minutes <laughs> yeah, no. we'll, let, we'll let us slide this one time if it wasn't bad enough that he's a partial preterist i mean this this uh, <laughs> this puts him over the top man yeah. Well, some j- there's so many different topics, interesting topics that we could dive into. This this one just occurred to me uh, this past week, and so I'm glad you guys are both on board. And Judd, I know this is right up your alley, so I'm going to throw this one to you first. We see references in the Bible to a number of locations that uh, seem to be especially important when it comes to um, supernatural events. I mean, Mount Hermon is one, and uh, you did your dissertation on uh, the uh, the Grotto of Pan or Benias at the base of Mount Hermon. Uh, but in a broader sense, not necessarily focusing on Mount Hermon, why are there certain areas that seem to be, um, can we use the por- word portals? I mean, hubs of supernatural activity? Sure. Well, that's certainly one way to look at it. Um, sort of the just the strict scholastic approach to sacred geography is that there has to be sacred activity there in order for it to be designated as such, or it has to be associated with some sort of uh, supernatural event or or chain of events. And you certainly have all of those at at a site like Mount Hermon or uh, or, uh, Panaeus as well. Uh, Now, as to whether I think that these could be portals, Yes, absolutely. I don't see any reason why they couldn't, particularly if you've got, um, you know, as in the case at, at Panaeus, you had centuries, if not millennia, uh, well, millennia of, of these uh, um, ceremonies to a god with many different faces. Uh, so it, it's, it's hard to figure out if it's a chicken or the egg sort of question where the in the case of a portal, was the portal there first, or was that it and it attract people there for ceremony and ritual, or did it come about as some sort of uh, cosmic brokerage um, brought on by the the ritual and ceremony? Doug, one of the spots that uh, we find really interesting. We're looking forward to getting back there and. Um... I know you've been back, uh, and you wrote about it first, so credit where it's due, and that's the uh, the Serpent Mound of Bashan. We've done a program on that here on this uh, this show, but uh, 
that seems to have had some special significance, even though it's not uh, biblical, but uh, certainly with all of the, um, uh, I think the Isra- Israel Antiquities Authorities documented something like 140 megalithic tombs on the back of this three-quarter mile long serpent-shaped ridge, just a quarter of a mile from Gilgal Rephaim, which itself is a significant location. And uh, you can't leave out that it's, uh, what, 20 miles from Mount Hermon? You can plainly see it on the northern horizon when you're there. Um, what what's your what are your thoughts on this? So why why are certain geographic locations the focus of ritual activity? So um, I think I told you guys that I wanted to brush up on my David Flynn for uh, <laughs> for this discussion, and um, you know he's been he's been gone from us now for almost I think a decade, um, maybe even a little longer than that, and. Um, this is the guy that first got me thinking about sacred geography, even before Heiser was really writing about it, at least that I saw. And he, he has some really interesting takes on just kind of the way that he believes. And I, I think that the um, esoterica, um, kind of occult, um, mystical religions, and, you know, as a Christian, he would say certainly uh, the Bible as well. How, how God really made this world, uh, focusing, having the heavens mirror the earth, um, having, uh, you know, g- going going to the divine council worldview for a moment, um, that God would divide these sons of gods up and give them portions of land. And like, who gets what and how is that decided? And and um, where do they go? And uh there's a, there's some really interesting stuff that I think we could maybe explore with this, t- with relation to the stars, um, the gods that might be behind those stars, um, why they're in certain places, why the worship of one god might predominate in one place over another place, and then of course that that could all come back pretty easily to Mount Hermon and the watchers coming down on on very interesting latitudes and longitudes. Mm-hmm. Um, that are, you know, somehow in this marriage of the heaven and the earth, they're they're wed together. And the ancient peoples knew this, and they knew that um, there was significant spiritual activity that was associated with it. Perhaps they thought they could control it. Um, certainly the worship of those gods in those places becomes very important to them. Where they're putting their uh, megaliths and their structures is completely related to this kind of stuff. So I don't know. I just I think that it, it I think there's something going on uh, with how God made this universe and how He made the earth and and the sky to mirror one another. That I just think that we haven't thought about this for so long, and in some ways it's kind of been um, turned into something that you shouldn't even think about or talk about. But it's not something that has to lead you in some kind of a gnostic or evil direction. It's if this is the way God really made the earth, then. We could expect that the Bible would uh, represent this, and it would talk about it in a way that is uh, biblical and godly and right, and and I think it would behoove us to think well about that. Yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, I mean, David Flynn deserves credit more than he gets, uh, and yeah, it partly be- he's he's been gone for a while. But uh, back in the day, um, he, his uh, book Temple at the Center of Time, which I. I tried getting my head around when it came out back in 2008 <laughs> and uh I, I guess i wasn't ready for it then i'm st- I just now digging into it and just already seeing things just in the scan the skimming that i did this evening um that uh Interesting. yeah uh, but but his his article uh, and we sharon and i interviewed him a few times back in um, uh, our old pid radio broadcast or our podcast and back in 2005 he wrote an article an occult translation of the roswell event Mm, yep, yep. And this was this was absolutely mind blowing in terms of the latitude and longitude of what happened at Roswell. And as we're recording this here, Fourth uh, of July weekend in in twenty yes. twenty two, it's the seventy fifth <laughs> right. anniversary of the Roswell event. I hadn't really planned that, but uh, it it was just stunning. And I'm going to put a link to this in the notes. So if you're watching or listening to this podcast, check the show notes wherever you're you're hearing this or or seeing this to get a link to the because uh, that article is still online and the interviews that we've done with david about the occult symbolism of the roswell crash plus uh, other interviews that we were blessed to do with him about uh, 
the book of Daniel at Washington, DC. Like what? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and the stuff in, in temple at the center of time, which I, I, again, I don't even remember reading this back in the day, but I, I highlighted a few things. If I can tap the right part of the screen here and, and try to get it, eh, the bookmarks notes. There we go. Um, Measurement from the center point, and, and he's, again, in the book of Daniel here, and uh, talking about the uh, night when uh, the the handwriting on the wall appeared at the party of Belshazzar, which was the night that Babylon was destroyed in 539 BC. You uh, measure from the point of uh, the temple's foundation in Jerusalem to the palace of, uh, at the political center of Babylon, the, uh, the, the palace of Belshazzar. Uh, it's uh, 539- 0.86 statute miles, 539.86. Well, it was October of 539 BC when Babylon was destroyed. But then further, he said, okay, and then now look at the prophecies of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, who was uh, received his revelation uh, at the Kivar Canal, which runs through the city of Nippur, which was where the temple of Enlil, the chief god of Mesopotamia, was located. And um, this was uh, 587 naut- or, uh, statute miles from the temple in Jerusalem. Well, the fall of Jerusalem took place in 587 BC. It's like, okay, this is the kind of thing that David was doing. And he, the the connection to the Roswell event is even more stunning. So again, uh, how, how do we wrap our heads around this as Christians? I mean, how does this fit into a biblical worldview? So he talks about um, things like uh, he'll take the platonic solids. Um, he'll take like a, a four-sided um, pyramid, and then he'll take a uh, which is the simple, the simplest uh, three-dimensional structure that we can have, and then he'll take like a um, an orb, a, a circle, and put those together and and talk about how in one one the the triangle would represent uh, finite, the circle represents infinite. And they're kind of marrying each other. So in one way, one represents heaven, one represents earth. So it's this, it's this um, coming together of the heaven and earth sort of a thing. And, and it does it through geometry. It does it through, you know, um, adding up the angles, um, doing division, pi, uh, you know, uh, those kinds of things. And you end up getting kind of these weird redundant numbers that just keep appearing over and over and over. Um, uh, Roswell was 1947, wasn't it? Right. And that's one of those numbers. Um, 2012 was one of those numbers. And, he, you know, he was doing some stuff on what, what could be taking place in 2012 back in those days. And, mm-hmm. and what you find is that you just, you know, you just keep seeing these, these redundancies that take place mathematically, they take place geometrically, and then they take place in terms of like the size of the earth, the size of the moon, the distance of the earth to the sun, just all kinds of things. It just keep happening over and over and over again. And so when you start applying those things, yeah, go ahead, Jed. Sorry. I was just going to interject that another proportion that you often see is the uh, 1 to 1.6 ratio, the golden mean. Right. Uh, that's the proportions for humans. Yeah. You see the number 666 appear regularly, um, not in a kind of a, a um, how do I say this nicely, to, you know, just kind of the way that I grew up, 666 is this devil's number that you can't ever even say out loud or whatever. I have a funny story. I don't know if you guys if I've ever told you this, but um, I go to seminary and they assign our post office boxes. This is Denver Seminary. <laughs> and uh, I go to the lady and she goes, man, I got some good news and some bad news. She goes, Bad news is we really don't have any post office boxes left except one. <laughs> or no, no that, that's the good news. And then and she was the bad news, six. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, interesting that I lost your audio just as you were uh, yeah. revealing the number of the yeah. post office box. But uh, can we assume yeah. it was so six? The post office box is. Uh, she goes. The bad news is that the post office box is six six six, and she goes. Do you want it? And I said, do I want it? That would be the greatest post office box ever for a seminary. And she's like, what? <laughs> she was the last three people I offered it to. They, they didn't want to have it at all. And I said, man, I'm not superstitious about this kind of stuff. So literally everything that I ever wrote for seminary had the number 666 on it. 
Oh my gosh. 